have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. We'll start reading tonight in verse number 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 16. You can stay seated this evening. I'll read to us. The Bible says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I have put you under oath before the Lord. Have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You know, from uh, really from the very beginning, whenever I was able to understand, I've heard pastor after pastor preach Thanksgiving messages, and most of the time it goes like this, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of times pastors will get behind the pulpit and they will begin to talk about how we should give thanks for everything that we have. And I begin to list things. And uh, tonight, that's not my goal. Um, they begin to say, hey, you should be thankful that you have good health. And you should be thankful that you have a home. Uh, you should be thankful for your children. And uh, just look at this and look at that. Look at the clothes on your back. And they say, as an encouragement, you need to thank God for the good things in your life. And really, the way they come at a text like this is very me-focused. Look at what God has done for me and what I have gotten. But tonight, I want to look at this passage from a different angle. Uh, my goal is to share that we should not just thank God for the roof over our head or for the car that we drive or for the education that we have or for our grandkids and all that. No, I submit to you tonight, we should thank God not only for the good things, as Easton just mentioned, we should also thank Him for the bad things as well. So before we dive into this passage, I want to pray and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, thank you again for giving us a chance to come back this evening to come together as a family, uh, those who are united by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I do ask, Lord, that you would Help us to understand that thankfulness goes far beyond just the temporal things that we've been given in this life. It would help us to understand that we should be thankful for the hard things, for the dark valleys and the, and the dark clouds that loom over our head that, that pour out hardship and trial and suffering. And I, I pray that you would help us to honor you with our time this evening and that Above all else, your son would be glorified and we would, we would know more of your, your purpose in the life of the Christian to make us more like him. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I, I want you to keep your Bibles open, if you will, tonight. Again, 1 Thessalonians 5, and I want to look at verse 18 and read that specific verse again, just so it's fresh on our mind. He says this, he says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. As I want to be the first to admit, this is a struggle. I mean, did you, did you hear what he said? He said, give thanks in all circumstances. That is a, that's a struggle. How can a man give thanks in all circumstances in his life? You know, sometimes I walk around as though I'm living in a fog. And some of you guys may be there yourself. There's, there's so much in life on our plates. A wife to pursue, children to teach and to train and to feed, 
laundry to do, sermons to prepare, teaching two different grades, every subject, physical needs, spiritual needs within the church, animals to tend to, a cow to milk, phone calls to answer, church issues to deal with, sick folks. It is easy for me to do exactly the opposite of verse number 18. Give thanks in all circumstances. But what I found that whenever I find myself in, in sort of this machine mindset of where I'm just, I'm just working and I'm just, I'm just doing, and, I'm, and that's a lot of times the way we find ourselves, just, just get through it and, and get all the work done and make sure. What I find is that whenever I go through and I do the work without rejoicing in the hardship, it brings other people down. It is not helpful for my wife and for my kids or, or anybody else around me when I just simply function as a machine. Grit your teeth, strengthen your chin, and get through it. That's not what we're called to do here in verse number 18. One of the best ways I can encourage my wife, my children, or even church folks is to be thankful always to be a person who is extremely thankful all the time. If we were to go pull Miss Emily out of the nursery tonight, and, and if you were to ask her honestly, can you describe Brother Travis outside of the pulpit? You know how she's going to describe me? Not as a tigger, just bouncing around everywhere, always happy, happy, happy. It's not the way she would describe me. In fact, it would be the opposite, more like, an Eeyore. And some of you guys, that may be the case for you as well. You, you do it. You do the work. You go to work. You tend to your family. But it's, it's not with a joyful attitude and a, an attitude of thankfulness. Maybe you're a mom here and, and you just have so much load, so much burden. And you do it. You do the work of a mother. But you don't do it with thankfulness. And that's not going to help anyone. So how do we maintain this attitude of thankfulness as we live life? How do we do that? And if you're taking notes this, this evening, you might write this down and then we'll deal with it as we have time. But how do you maintain an attitude of thankfulness? Number one, we stand on who God is. We rest in who God is, what He has done, who we are in Him, and future grace. Now, we're going to talk about each of those things tonight. But again, verse 18, Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So the idea here in verse number 18 is what we call habitual gratitude. It's a present tense ver verb indicating continuous action. So when he says in verse number 18, give thanks in all circumstances, he's not just saying around Thanksgiving we need to draw people to the table and say what we love about them or what you're saying. That's not, that's not it. I'm not saying you can't do that, but verse 18 says it, this should be a constant pattern, a habitual pattern in your life where you are giving thanks to the Lord, yes, for the good things, but anything he lays on your plate. You're thankful for it. Now, this is a, a, a mark of the Christian life. There's no way the unregenerate man can be thankful for every circumstance in his life. And it's very possible that those that may be listening here this evening or online, you say, I can't be thankful. Why should I be thankful? You can't simply because your heart's not been changed. The mark of the Christian life is to be rejoicing even in the midst of dark trials. It's, it's, very, it's very important that we heed verse 18 to, be, to give thanks in all circumstances. And this has practical implications. Why should we give thanks in every circumstance? Did you know that a thankful person is less likely to be a critical person? What do I mean by that? 
You see, when we are thankful for the people God has put into our life, we begin to look at them as objects of God's grace instead of a burden. There are many un... Let me, let me ask this question. Do you have people in your life that give you plenty of reason to complain and little reason for thankfulness? Are there people in your life where you just want to grumble? Man, why do they work here? Why... Are they my neighbors? Why? We won't go any further because it can get pretty messy pretty quick. But you need to realize that one of the marks of a Christian is to be thankful and not critical of other people. You need to realize that the person you are most thankful for is that way simply because of the grace of God. Oh, you say, well, I'm thankful for my wife, but everybody else I don't really care about. Your wife or your spouse or your grandkid, whoever you're most thankful for, is that way simply because of the grace of God. When you are tempted to be unthankful for someone or when you're tempted to be critical of someone else, I would encourage you to look into the mirror of God's Word. If you can get still enough and if you can get quiet enough and you're able to open up God's Word, what you will realize is that if you, if God was to treat you the way you treat other people, you would go to hell. Do you understand that? Like when we, when we understand the practical implications of thankfulness, it affects the relationships in our life. We're to be thankful. We're not to be critical of other people. We're not to treat other people the way many of us do. All right, I need to keep going. What is another reason why many times we are unthankful? It's because and, uh, we have many idols in our hearts. Why are we unthankful? Many times we are unthankful of other people in our life because of unmet expectations. Maybe it's unmet expectations from other people, but it, it can also be unmet expectations from the Lord. Why are we unthankful? When others do not meet our expectations, when God does not meet our expectations, we begin to grumble begin to complain. We are unthankful many times for our children. Why? Because they don't meet the expectations that we have. Many times we're unthankful for our spouse. We don't show them gratitude. Why? Because we have this certain standard made up in our mind and when they don't meet that we begin to grumble. We begin to complain. Sometimes we have this expectation of a pastor a Sunday school teacher, and when they don't meet it, what do we do? We become unthankful. We begin to grumble, and we begin to complain. So, another reason why we're unthankful. I'm, I'm kind of trying to pull some thoughts together. Another reason why we see unthankfulness, particularly in the church, is because of a lack of spiritual maturity. Many unthankful people are immature in the faith. We're not reflecting God in us and how we're treating other people. Think about this when it comes to immaturity. Can you think of anything more annoying than a whiny child? You ever been around a whiny child? Many times that's how we are within the church. We're like whiny children. We're not yet mature. God has called us to be thankful and not grumble. And be thankful for everything in our life. All right, now, I want, to, I want to clarify something as we go on. We're talking about being thankful, but I want to show you how so easily we can turn our thankfulness into something that's not, not biblical. Let me read this to you. It's an old, old preacher. His name was Hebert. He said this. 
The Christian should meet every adverse in life, not with a spirit of stoic resignation, but with a spirit of unfailing gratitude. So God, when he tells us to be thankful, to give thanks in all circumstances, he's not calling us to be what's called a stoic. Now you're scratching your head. You say, well, what is a stoic? So there was this philosophy years and years ago that when hardships come your way, you just simply grit your teeth, bear it, and go through it. So you study the Stoics in history, you'll find that that's many good traits going for them. But here in this passage, God's not calling us to be a Stoic. And when hard things come your way, like cancer or rebellious child, he's not telling you just to stiffen up, to pull a John Wayne and get through it. That's not what he's calling us to do. God commands us to actually be thankful for what is happening in our life. Not just grit it up, but actively say, Lord, this is hard. But I want to thank you for it because I know through this valley, when we get through this valley, there's going to be something on the other side that's going to make me, as I go through this valley, to be more like Christ. Even though it's dark, even though it's painful, even though it hurts so much. God's called us not to just grit under and take it with no emotion. He's calling us to be thankful for it, to see his purpose through it. We understand that even in dark days, he's still in control and he will use it. The call to thankfulness in this passage is not a call to be disciplined or strong-willed. Some people get through the circumstances in life, just simply because of a strong will or discipline. No. We get through the circumstances in life as a Christian, biblically, because we believe. Verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. How can someone so weak, someone like Eeyore, who even whenever they see a, a flower pop up and say, I'm not going to sniff that flower because I know there's a bee in it. You know, there's people like that, Eeyores, who only see the bad and everything. How can someone like that maintain a spirit of thankfulness even through trials? It's not because they're strong-willed. It's not because they're disciplined. It's because they believe. They believe that God has a good purpose in the midst of the trial. Even weak people can rejoice in adversity if they believe God is who He says He is. All right. I want to read this to you. This is another gentleman years and years ago. Hebert says this, It is typical in a life of unbelief that one will lack Thanksgiving. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. When you look at Romans chapter 1, this is fallen man. This is man who is unconverted. So much sin... So much darkness, so much wickedness. And then you get to Romans chapter 1, verse 21, and it says this, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God. And then what does it say? Or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. All of the crimes that we read about in Romans chapter 1, all the filthiness and the nastiness, all of that, where did it stem from? It stemmed from a heart that was not thankful to God. So when we read verse number 21, it's a reminder to us one of the greatest characteristics in an unbeliever's life is to have a heart full of unthankfulness. One of the, on the flip side of that, one of the great indicating marks of someone whose heart has been changed is one of thankfulness. Thankful to God in the good times and in the good gifts and in the hard times and the bad things that are laid on their plate. I 
I'll say this as we move on. When you personally encounter trials that make you not, not want to be grateful, understand this. God knows exactly what you need. I don't know what you need. You don't know what you need. But God knows exactly what you need in order to be conformed into the image of Christ. Did you know that? He knows how much or how little it will take to continue to mold you and shape you. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18. I want to point this out as we talk about thankfulness and a heart of unthankfulness. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18 says this, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is a debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And he says this, Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence. So you go back to the first part of chapter 5. He said, hey, don't do this. Don't do this. Do not have any other gods before me. And then he gets to the passage we just read. And he says, do this. So with the same, how can we say this? With the same passion that we're to say no to sin, we're to use that same passion to kill the sin of unthankfulness in our heart. There's a lot of sins that we could bring up here in the context of, of the church tonight that we'd be like, yeah, get rid of that. But how many times do we preach messages on having an unthankful spirit? It's one of those sort of cultural sins that we're like, oh, it's okay. They're just having a bad day. Well, that's not, that's not the way it's read here in Ephesians chapter 5. God calls us not to be bitter people and unthankful people. Why? Because that's an indicating mark of someone who does not know God. When you have an unthankful heart, you are failing to reflect the God who is resident inside of your heart. It's a sin. It's something that we should repent of. All right, I want to turn over to Colossians chapter 3. Feel free to turn with me. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 says this. I'm going to go ahead and read. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, and it says, With thanksgiving in your heart to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So the emphasis in Colossians 3 is, Notice the first part of verse 16. Letting the word of Christ dwell richly in you. How can someone have a thankful heart? By allowing the word of God to richly dwell in you. By meditating on the gospel. By learning it. By rehearsing it in your mind. Understanding what had to happen in order for a sinful man to be reconciled to a holy God. You want to be a thankful person? This has to be rehearsed in our minds. It's not just meditating on it. It's learning more about the gospel. And the more we learn about the gospel, the more we cherish the gospel, greater and greater joy will be produced in our heart. And greater and greater thanksgiving will come about in our hearts. So when you have a dark spirit, when you're really not thankful for what you're going through, or you're not even thankful for the good things in your life, the Bible directs you. It's as though he takes our head, and he, he turns our head to look back at the cross. Hey, you're not thankful? Look at Christ. But he doesn't stop there. Then he turns our heads to see the resurrection, to show that our pardon has, has been sealed. God has accepted the sacrifice. And then, you know what he does at that point? He, 
He turns our head from the resurrection to future grace to show us so much more that we have to be thankful for into the future. So I encourage me, if you have a bitter heart and you just, you're just living a life that's just kind of, I'm just getting the work done, there's no joy in my life, my encouragement to you is remember the gospel. Remember your conversion. What God saved you from. Where would you be if God had not intervened in your life? Stop thinking about what you don't have or, or what you are not. I see so many Christians grumbling and complaining about what they don't have or, or even, man, I just thought I would be here spiritually at this point. I want to remind you of how you can be thankful. I want to remind you from where God has brought you to where you are today. And I'm, I'm speaking to those that are saved. You know, we look around, and this is a beautiful time of the year. People are traveling. People are deer hunting. There's people out in our community buying presents, preparing food for this week. But where are you? You're here. You're tonight. And you're listening to a preacher. You look at your life and you think, man, I don't have anything to, to be thankful for. But, guys, listen. Look where God has you tonight and see his grace. You could have been anywhere else tonight, but God in his grace has you linked with a local church to hear God's word and to be able to fellowship. If that isn't an act of God's grace in your life, I don't know what it is. So many other things. Some of you think about where you would have been prior to conversion. Some of you may have been in a drunken stupor. Oh, it's the holidays. What else can I do? Let's go watch some basketball. Get hammered. But God in his grace has you sitting here in church. And for that, we can be grateful. I want us to look at one more passage tonight. Romans chapter 8. Verse number 28. If you're going to understand joy, if you're going to understand thankfulness, you have to understand Romans 8, 28. By which the Bible says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. I do not know what I would do if this verse was not in scripture. All things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. Everything, guys listen to me. Every single thing that God does in this world, he's doing for the sake of his son and for his church. Everything. I have people come and ask questions about Israel. I have people come and ask questions about cancer. I've, every single thing that God does in this world, He's doing to produce good and glory. Like what? Life? When God grants life, it is for His glory. When God allows death, it is for His glory. When God gives peace, in a nation, why? It's for his glory. When God gives war, it is also for his glory. Famine is for his glory. Prosperity is for his glory. Pain in your life that you're experiencing can be used for your good and his glory. Pleasure can be used for God's glory and for your good. Everything God uses according to Romans 8.28. Now, I've got to confess something before we go downstairs and eat. I'm not a perfect model for this passage. There is still so much room in my life to grow in this area. I don't, I don't rejoice in all things. Do I, do I forget that God's using even the pain and the suffering for His? Yes. I'm weak. I'm wrong and I'm sinful. Why? Well, let's boil it down. Is it because there's too much on my plate? No. It's because of my heart. 
It's a heart issue. When I am that way, when I'm unthankful, when you're unthankful, you know why? Because I don't want what God wants. Well, I'm an unthankful person because I think I have it figured out. Because I want to be Lord and King and make the call. Or maybe it's I want what God wants, but I don't want it the way God provides it. I want it easy. There's a hymn writer, I'm sure Micah knows about him way more than I do. His name was John Newton, and he wrote a bunch of old hymns. And he wrote one that's pretty unfamiliar, but in my opinion, it's, it's one of my favorites. Uh, and what he does in this hymn is he talks about at a certain point in his life where he said, man, I really want to grow and look like Christ. I want to be conformed to look like Jesus. And so he, he prays that. And he expected God to answer through Bible reading and through prayer. But you know what the Lord did? He opened the gates of hell. And adversity come into John Newton's life. And when John Newton steps back, he says, Lord, why? what are you doing? I just wanted to be like your son. And the Lord replies, I'm just doing what you ask. You know, we have to understand that in the life of a believer, some of the times that we are most refined and we most look like, like Christ is in the furnace, when those impurities are being burned away. I hear a lot of people who say, man, I want to I live like Christ. I want to live a life pleasing to the Lord. And then trial hits. I see people many times going through difficult marriages. And they say, man, I just want out. I'm just done with it. Well, why do they want out? Because they don't want what God wants. God's telling them, even in this, I'm working in you. If you believe me, if you continue on, I will use your broken marriage to conform you into the image of Christ. There is no exit plan. A lot of people say, no, I'd rather have an easy marriage. I want a rich, handsome husband like on Hallmark. Just kidding. I've never watched Hallmark. But the point is this. God knows exactly what you need. You're in a hard marriage. Trust him. God can use hard marriages to make you more like Jesus. God knows what you need. You're, whatever you're going through tonight, whatever season of life you're about to enter into, trust God and be thankful. I see different men all across the United States that I went to school with, and it seems like at the height of their ministry, they're struck down by cancer or chemo and radiation, and they're spending months and months in the bed, and it's easy for us to think, man, why? This dude had a vibrant ministry, and now he's in the band, and he can't even, he can't even drink out of a straw. Why? Why in bed? Because God loves that man more than he loves that man's ministry. God is using the trials in that man's life to make him more like Christ. God doesn't need that man. He doesn't need that man's ministry. But God does love him. And he wants him to be conformed to Christ. And he gets to determine the way by which that happens. Whether it be cancer or whatever. Understand, God's goal in your life is not the same as your goal. What do I mean by that? You see, in, our today, in today's culture, a man's worth is determined by what he can do. But that's not the way God measures the worth of a man. In Scripture, a man or a woman's worth is measured by what they become, not what they can do. It's measured by their grace of God. So you may say, man, I'm not as effective as I am anymore. I'm going through this hardship. My knees are wore out. I'm going through congestive heart failure. I don't know what it is. But understand, your measure of worth is not found in that. It's measured in who you are becoming. Few more things, we're almost done. My question to you this evening is this how can we not rejoice and be thankful? We were once enemies who were hostile to God. 
You know what God could have done in your life? He could have simply purposed to put you in a cooler place in hell, and that would warrant Thanksgiving, right? He could have just done that. He could have snatched us out of hell and put us in sort of this neutral zone, not to suffer, nor to see his presence. That it would still be cause for praise and thankfulness, right? If he had taken away our sins and made us able to stand outside of heaven to look through a window, just to imagine, we'd still be worthy to praise him. If he had made us like the angels with the privilege of standing in his presence and ministering to him, that would be cause for praise and thanksgiving. But he didn't do any of that. You know what he did? He made us sons and daughters and co-heirs with Christ. You're not just an angel. You're not just someone that receives a lesser judgment. When Christ bought you with his shed blood and satisfied the wrath of God, he made you a son. He made you a daughter. How can we not be thankful? I'm proof that we can't. <laughs> after hearing the gospel, after hearing a a message like this, many of our hearts will still be bent on being unthankful. My encouragement to you is to be thankful. <laughs> so if you guys have walked in the back of the church and you were thankful, and then when you heard this message, your thankfulness diminished. So thanks, Brother Travis, right? Because God has exposed in your heart how truly unthankful you really are. What's my encouragement to you tonight? Don't be a John Wayne and just stiffen your chin and, and go through without grumbling the bad things in your life. That's not my encouragement. My encouragement to you is to look to Christ. Why? You need to look to Him and see that your sins have been forgiven. You're completely righteous before God. And He loves you with an undiminished love. That's something to be thankful for. I invite you to bow your head and close your eyes.